Hi guys, today we're going to be talking about mineral polymorphism and PT diagrams. Now, PT diagrams and polymorphism might sound like terms that are a little intimidating, but don't worry, they're not that complicated. And polymorphism is just an important concept to understand in mineralogy, just so we know that minerals have different structural varieties, and these may not have different compositions, but their structure is different. And that's what polymorphism means. And these polymorphs, these different structural varieties of minerals, are stable under different pressure temperature conditions. And that's why we look at the different polymorphs of a mineral on PT diagrams, just like the one shown here to the left. So it's not that complicated. And in this video, I'm going to explain what common minerals have polymorphs and where those polymorphs lie on pressure temperature diagrams, aka their stability fields. And we'll talk about what trends we see in high temperature polymorphs versus low and high pressure polymorphs versus high and that can help remember the differences in their structure correlating with the differences in their stability so let's get started so here we just have some introductory information regarding mineral polymorphism like i already mentioned some minerals can occur in different forms or different structures and these structural varieties have the same chemical composition or chemical makeup as the other structures varieties of the same mineral, but they're called polymorphs. Polymorph just means many shape, which makes sense because there's many different shapes or structures of the same mineral. And the change of a polymorph into another polymorph is due to a change in pressure and or temperature. And it's important that we do not confuse polymorphs, such as shown here on this diagram, like cristobalite and tritomite of quartz with minerals. So uh, different minerals have different compositions. And there are minerals that we talk about like plagioclase feldspar, for example, that has solid solution series of albite to anorthite. So what that would mean is a change in composition. In the case of plagioclase, albite has more sodium and then the same general aluminum silicate composition. And then anorthite has more calcium in it and then the same general aluminum silicate composition following that. So it's important that we note when the composition changes, the mineral changes. The structure changing without the composition changing means the only thing changing is that it's a different polymorph. Now that we have that out of the way, let's move on to the types of polymorphism that we see in minerals. So what we see is four main types. These are called reconstructive polymorphism, displacive polymorphism, order disorder polymorphism, and polytypism. We'll go over reconstructive polymorphism first. Reconstructive polymorphism involves extensive structural rearrangement, the breakage of bonds, a large amount of energy, and it's not easily reversed. So this is probably the most extensive change in terms of polymorphism types. And many common minerals that exhibit polymorphism fall under this category of polymorphism. These include feldspar polymorphs, K-spar, polymorphs or potassium feldspar polymorphs, carbon polymorphs, so like diamond and graphite, which we'll go over later in the examples portion, calcium carbonate, so aragonite and calcite, pyrite and marcasite or iron disulfide minerals, and quartz, except quartz exhibits a couple different types of polymorphism. And what I mean by this is that quartz has polymorphs shown here to the right, stichovite, cosite, tritomite, and cristobalite, but it also has something called alpha and beta quartz or low and high quartz. And these alpha and beta quartz polymorphs are actually examples of displacive polymorphs, which we'll talk about later. But the other four I mentioned are examples of reconstructive polymorphs. But why might some polymorphs favor high temperatures or high pressures and some polymorphs favor low temperatures and low pressures? So these crystal structure changes show some trends, for example, expanded structures or polymorphs with low specific gravity have higher lattice energies, which are stable at higher temperatures. So if you remember specific gravity or basically relative density from one of my previous mineralogy videos, I'll link it up here for you if you want to check it out. We talked about how you can relatively or qualitatively measure this G value or specific gravity value by kind of feeling how heavy something feels compared to something else. In that video, we gave the example of galena versus halite and galena 
galena feels a lot heavier even though you might be holding a piece of galena that's the same size as the halite you're holding and that's because it has a higher specific gravity and you can think of this as basically density and that kind of helps because you can understand that the more expanded structures with a lower density basically are stable at higher temperatures which if we look over here to the right we can see that cosite beta quartz and cristobalite are stable at relatively high temperatures meaning that they probably have a relatively low g value or specific gravity and a relatively expanded structure whereas something like alpha quartz for example probably has a relatively compact structure and maybe a high g value and we'll show all the specific gravity values of all of these different polymorphs of all of these different common minerals that have polymorphs later in the lecture when we go over the examples what about displacive polymorphism now we just mentioned that alpha and beta quartz are examples of displacive polymorphs so what does that mean well remember how we talked about reconstructive polymorphs and how they require really extensive structural rearrangement breakage of bonds large energy requirements and they're not easily reversed we'll basically take the exact opposite of all those phrases and that's what displacive polymorphs are that means only a slight structural rearrangement no breakage of bonds a very small energy requirement and they're easily reversed now like we already mentioned alpha and beta quartz fall under this category so the switch from alpha to beta quartz can be reversed and it doesn't require a large structural rearrangement or extensive structural rearrangement and we can see that both alpha and beta quartz are hexagonal and crystal structure and as we'll see later that's not common for polymorphs to be in the same crystal system if you want to learn more about what hexagonal means and what the crystal systems are you can watch my crystal systems song video i'll link it up here for you but basically high quartz or beta quartz just has a slightly higher symmetry than low quartz i talk about symmetry in my symmetry and miller indices video if you want to check that out i'll also link it up here for you um, basically higher symmetry just means that it's slightly more symmetric you can do slightly more symmetry operations with beta quartz than you can with alpha quartz and again we see the stability fields of alpha beta quartz in this diagram moving to order disorder polymorphism this one has to do with just exactly what it sounds like order and disorder within the structure of a mineral basically solid solution of two elements can occur at a specific site in a crystal structure and can occur in a way that we call perfect order partial order or total disorder and before i move on i do want to specify that i did say earlier that solid solution series tend to be different compositions or a range of slightly different compositions among different minerals in a group of minerals however you can also have the solid solution or ionic substitution events happening at individual sites in a crystal structure that's not changing the overall composition of the mineral. Now, this is going to be easily understood when I give you the example, and the example is potassium feldspar. Potassium feldspar is K potassium and then aluminum silicate mineral that we know has polymorphs, microcline, orthoclase, and sanidine, and their structures are shown here to the right. So what does this order disorder thing mean? and how is it not changing composition if there's solid solution going on? Well, microcline is an example of a perfect order polymorph. This is because it has one aluminum three plus ion that fills one of the four tetrahedral sites in its mineral structure, and all the other three tetrahedral sites are occupied by a silicon ion. And this means that it's a 100% probability of finding aluminum in one of the four tetrahedral sites. This is more ordered than, for example, the total disorder of sanidine. We're going to skip orthoclase and we're going to talk about that in a second because it's kind of an in-between polymorph of the two. Sanidine, the total disorder polymorph of K-SPAR, has an equal probability of finding an aluminum ion in any of the four tetrahedral sites. And so it's kind of randomized. And because of this, we know instead of a one to three ratio and a hundred percent probability of finding aluminum in one of the four sites, it is instead a one 
one fourth to three fourths aluminum to silicon ratio. And it's an equal probability of finding aluminum in any of the four tetrahedral sites. And therefore it is the same overall composition. So the same amount of aluminum to silicon in both structures, but it is a randomized pattern compared to the perfect order example of microcline and therefore its total disorder polymorph. The partial order example is orthoclase. This is kind of an intermediate. Basically, aluminum is distributed over two equivalent sets of the tetrahedra. And so that would be represented by this half aluminum to half silicon ratio. Again, you come out in the same overall composition, just a different structure, different probability of finding aluminum among different tetrahedral sites. So ordered versus disordered. It's exactly what it sounds like. And regarding stability trends for these polymorphs, we see that the perfect order polymorph microcline is stable at lower temperatures and the total disorder polymorph sanidine is stable at high temperatures and the partial disorder polymorph orthoclase is in between the two. And so that's the trend for these order disorder polymorphs. Lastly, polytypism, which I'm just going to briefly go over before we get into the examples, because this is really just applicable to sheet silicates, for example, or layered silicates like mica and clay minerals, and basically just means different ways in which sheets of atoms are stacked or arranged in a crystal structure. And for this reason, these polytypes or different structures in which these mica or clay minerals can stack their atomic layers are also called stacked polymorphs. So now moving on to the examples portion, which I think is going to really bring it together for your understanding if you're having any trouble understanding. And also it's just good to know these common minerals that have polymorphs. So these include quartz, as we saw earlier, feldspar, caspar, as we saw earlier, carbon, as we mentioned, diamond and graphite, calcium carbonate, and iron disulfide or pyrite and marcasite. So let's get into the quartz polymorphs. For quartz, like we mentioned, we have polymorphs, stichovite shown up here, and stichovite is tetragonal in terms of its crystal system and has a G value or specific gravity of 4.29, a very high G value, which if you recall, low G values tend to be high temperature polymorphs because they have a more expanded structure and therefore higher lattice energy, whereas as a high G value would indicate a relatively low temperature polymorph. And we can see that it's really low temperature and high pressure shown here in its gray stability field. Another reason it has this high G value is because high G value means more compact, more dense, and high pressure would really help to make a mineral lattice a bit more compact. And then we have cosite, which is monoclinic and has a G value of 2.92, much lower G value. And this is probably why its temperature and pressure stability field extends to higher temperatures because it has that lower G value, therefore higher lattice energy. Then we have A quartz or alpha quartz or low quartz, whatever you want to call it shown here. And this is hexagonal with a G value of 2.65. And compared to beta quartz, which is also hexagonal, like we talked about, less extensive structural rearrangement because it is a displacive polymorph. And this has a G value of 2.53. Now these aren't that different from each other, but they make sense because the higher temperature polymorph beta quartz has a relatively lower G value compared to the lower temperature polymorph of alpha quartz. Then we have cristobalite, which is tetragonal and has a G value of 2.32 compared to tritomite, which is monoclinic, again, similar to cosine, and has a G value of 2.27. And we can see that both cristobalite and tritomite occupy very close temperature and pressure regions on the stability field diagram. Next, we have felt Feldspar polymorphs, and we talked about caspar polymorphs, but we haven't talked about the feldspar polymorphs and delucite, selimanite, and kyanite. These are all examples of feldspar minerals that have the composition Al2SiO5. Again, composition stays the same, structure is what's changing. What we can see is that andalusite and selimanite have similar crystal systems. They're both orthorhombic, but they have a slightly different structure, and because of this, they have slightly different G values or specific gravity values. We can see that andalusite has a slightly lower specific gravity at 3.15, and selimanite has a slightly higher specific gravity at 3.24. And kyanite has a different crystal system altogether as it is triclinic, and its G value is 3.65, a bit higher than the other two. Now, 
the trends that we normally see with low G values tending toward the high temperature side of the graph works a little bit for kyanite because as it has a higher G value, it trends toward the higher pressure values and lower temperature side of the graph. However, for andalusite and selimanite, it doesn't work all that well because the higher G value is actually to the right at the higher temperatures and the lower andalusite G value is at the lower temperatures, but it actually has a pretty high temperature range and goes from pretty much any of those temperatures on that graph. So just disclaimer here, trends don't mean rules. Now the case bar polymorphs, like we already mentioned, include microcline, orthoclase, and sanidine. And the color differences, by the way, of all of these different polymorphs, regardless of the mineral type, are a consequence of the crystal structure change. Because the structure is changing, you can have different ions substituting in different amounts depending on the crystal structure. And you might be saying, well, as soon as different ions and different amounts of those ions start to substitute into the structure, aren't you changing the composition? And doesn't that go against what polymorphs are defined as? Well, yes, good catch. It technically does. However, the ions that cause colors that we see in the hand samples of these minerals are typically in trace amounts, and they count more as impurities than actually being counted in the composition of the mineral. And in terms of the structure of microcline orthoclase and sanidine. Recall that we talked about these in the order disorder polymorphism section, and these are triclinic for microcline and monoclinic for both orthoclase and sanity. And also recall that we have the low temperature microcline polymorph, the high temperature sanidine polymorph, and the intermediate orthoclase polymorph. Next, we have carbon polymorphs. We talked about diamond and graphite as the examples of carbon polymorphs. And as we can see, their structures are quite different. So if we look over here, we have isometric diamond structure. So a cubic or isometric structure where the carbon atoms are bonding in a way that they're making a framework or network structure, whereas the graphite is in a sheet structure. It is thin sheets of atoms with just attraction in between those sheets. Because there's no strong bonds in between the sheets, like there is in the framework or network structure of diamond, it is a much softer mineral. Because of this, the hard hardness of diamond is 10, the highest hardness on the Mohs scale, and the hardness of graphite is around 1 to 2 on the Mohs scale. The specific gravities are also quite different. Diamond you have at 3.52, and that's because it's a much more compact and densely packed and bonded structure, and graphite at 2.23. Now, the stability fields of graphite and diamond are clear in that the pressure is the most important part of the graphite to diamond transition. The higher the pressure, obviously you're going to get that temperature pressure stability field of a diamond and the lower the pressure and temperature you get graphite. Next we have the calcium carbonate polymorphs. Calcium carbonate polymorphs, like I already mentioned, include calcite and aragonite. And like we mentioned when we talked about case bar polymorphs, the crystal structure controls the ionic substitution and therefore the color differentiations between calcite and aragonite. And as we can see, aragonite is rhombohedral and calcite is hexagonal. But the structure also controls stability, which is important when it comes to marine life. Why? Because marine organisms often secrete skeletons made of aragonite or calcite. However, calcite is the more stable polymorph. Aragonite is only metastable and is more soluble than calcite. Hence, the ACD is shallower than the CCD. What the heck does that mean? Well, there's something called the CCD or carbonate compensation depth in the ocean where carbonate material begins to dissolve at depths below the that. And that's because it becomes unstable at those depths in the ocean. And that goes into how much carbon dioxide is down there and the solution pH. And because calcium carbonate minerals are soluble, it can dissolve. And so those depths are the depths at which calcite dissolves. However, there's also the ACD, which is the aragonite compensation depth, which is shallower than the CCD because aragonite is less stable and more soluble than calcite. So it dissolves at shallower depths, so sooner than calcite does in the ocean. And this can affect how certain marine organisms that have skeletons made of calcium carbonate can survive or dissolve or how they're preserved and all of that. So that's how that affects that. But I talk about those types of marine organisms and their ecology and many other videos. I actually talked about the CCD a bit more in the foram or foraminifera video if you want to check that out. The last polymorphs we have are the iron sulfide polymorphs, pyrite and marcasite. Pyrite is probably something you've heard of. Fool's gold. It's pictured here. It is just absolutely
absolutely beautiful as we can see it is isometric or cubic in structure whereas marcasite is orthorhombic however has the same composition as pyrite so how do they form well pyrite forms in higher temperature pressure conditions and slightly acidic to sometimes even alkaline solutions whereas marcasite forms under low temperature and pressure conditions and in solutions that are highly acidic and this is because pyrite's high temperature and relatively neutral solution ph conditions allow the iron and sulfur ions to join together in compact cubic arrangements with strong bonding at a g value or specific gravity value of pretty high 5.02 whereas the conditions that form marcasite cause the iron and sulfur ions to join in a relatively looser orthorhombic structure with weaker bonding so a g value of around 4.89 this weaker bonding also makes marcasite less stable and more susceptible to rapid oxidation and oxidation basically just means rusting when it comes to reduced iron sulfides like pyrite and marcasite so if you've ever seen that red rusty color that's what these two minerals would turn into if allowed to oxidize that's all i got i hope that was helpful the videos coming up include the second part of the optical mineralogy videos and the beginning of our igneous metamorphic and sedimentary minerals journey and i'll start that with a song that lists all the igneous minerals and hopefully that will help you get familiar with the names of igneous minerals and i'll do the same for metamorphic and sedimentary and then also economic minerals later on so that's it i'll see you guys there for those videos or if they're out please go check them out now and thanks again for watching bye hey guys sorry i'm back i just forgot to mention that the book that i'm using to make these mineralogy lectures is called earth materials introduction to mineralogy and petrology by cornelius klein and anthony philpotts and it's a really good book i have it linked in my description if you want to check it out and i always link the textbooks i use for these lectures in my description but i don't know if you guys know that so i just thought i'd mention it for your reference there there you go and i think that's it now so <laughs> thanks again bye just means many shapes so it makes perfect sense <laughs> Nike. Hey guys, if you want to know a little more about me, this is my cat, Nike. She's very sweet. She's kind of complaining right now because she doesn't want me to hold her, but she's got this broken tail. It's not painful to her at all. We checked and made sure. It's just that she looks a little funny. And uh, her name is Nike because we thought that when she lies down, her tail looks like a Nike check mark. So there's a little tidbit about me for, I'm sure, the end of this video. Say bye, Nikers.